welcome to the Jewish Art Salon Open Studios program. The series is curated and hosted by Judith Joseph and I. Program advisor is Jewish Art Salon director, Yona Ferwer. Team members are Hannah Bizentel Elias, Justin Ameto. Reminding you all about our call for art after the flood regenesis. We are looking forward to your submissions. Artists that have already presented are welcome to apply regarding the new. What makes a work of art Jewish? What makes an artist Jewish? Today, Jewish Art Salon Open Studios presents a special edition about authenticity, authenticity identity. A group exhibition opening April 6 at the Das Israel Congregation, Washington. The exhibit will be viewable by appointment from May 14, 2021. The program today includes the exhibition organizer, curator, and five artists, among them, Judy Joseph. Please put your questions in the chat for today's present presenters. I'd like to uh, invite uh, Robert Batman. Uh, he's the founder of the Jewish art nonprofit Day 8. Please unmute yourself, Robert. Thank you so much, Dorit, for, for having us and, and, and Yona and for, for everyone for being here. It's been about 18 months working on this exhibition and it's meaningful to me as a as a Jewish artist to be part of it. I, there is a lot of there's a lot of what I do, how I exist in the world that I feel like has its roots not just in cultural heritage of uh, grandparents as immigrants and as and the Jewish learning that I've done, but sort of the the meaning of what it is to be Jewish, and I. I appreciate this opportunity, which in some ways is unique for me to be exploring my Judaism in the artistic sense. I, I live in a world in which what I do with day eight, as much as it is, as much as it's very much inspired by the sense of, you know, there's seven days of creation, every day is, every day is day eight. We get caught up in the past, we get caught up in the future, and that through the arts, we can be, contribute to the healing of the world. Um, and so that's, while that's my sort of personal inspiration and in being part of day eight, this opportunity to be a part of a specifically Jewish visual arts exhibition is new to me. Very quickly, I want to, I want to give background of that, which is that about five years ago, uh, Anna Fine Four, who is one of the artists in the show, approached me and asked, related to the Jerusalem Biennial, if I could consider bring together a group of artists that would, from the DC region, that would go to that show. And I, and I acknowledge that both financially as well as that we, I couldn't afford to consider that, nor could I afford, nor did I know who those artists might be. And so about five years ago, I created this private Facebook group, which is the Jewish Artists of the National Capital Region. And then two years ago, saw this opportunity to apply for Jewish community funding through Hazon's Hakel Incubator. And that afforded me the opportunity to just try and push out some roots a little bit deeper. And through Susan Rosebaum Abramowitz, I was introduced to our curator. And it is and it was through his willingness to, to, to be a part of an application that we then, that I then wrote this grant, we, we got Addis on board because of Ori's participation in the thing. And then we're now able to do this exhibition. For me, the, the root of this authenticity and identity thing is this sense of sort of duality that sometimes in the, in the, general, in the general public, there's, a, there's this thing code switching, which is generally defined as when someone generally understood as when someone would speak a certain way and then they would speak and their, and their word choice would be different. And I'm interested in how artists do that and how artists, especially Jewish artists are living within a climate where our Judaism is not always necessarily accepted that the, while many Jewish artists have become successful it's harder to sort of do so 
if you're really overtly Jewish, if you're like really Jewish. And so I'm interested in, in that sort of authenticity and identity piece of it. We, we have, we've, we've had this opportunity to review all this exceptional artwork that was, that was delivered for Ori to consider. And it, and he has been able to, from considering it, be, contextualize it in ways that I think are really, are really relevant. So we have not just a beautiful exhibition, but also one that, that carries meaning, not just in the individual works, but in, in the groups of works. And so it's my, so it's my, it's my pleasure to get to be a part of it and to get to know more Jewish artists. There are, there are a lot, about half of the artists involved are from the national capital region from, and about, and I hope that we will be able to do more as a, as a local cohort. And about half are from around the country and around the world. And, and as we've said, many of them are Jewish art salon members. Um, I cannot possibly very, very briefly introduce curator Ori Soltis, um, but I, I, do have, I do have a very brief bio of him, which is that he is a professor of Jewish civilization at Georgetown University, a preeminent scholar of, of Jewish and religious artwork, uh, former director and curator of the B'nai B'rith Klutznik Museum, the National Jewish Museum, co-founding director of the Holocaust Art Restitution Project and author of many books and articles, including Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture, Fixing the World, Jewish American Painters in the 20th Century, and The Ash and Rainbow, The Arts and the Holocaust. Thank you to Jewish Art Salon, Yona Ver, Ver, Judith and Dory for having us all. I'm gonna put a couple um, links in the chat with more information about this particular exhibition. And thank you, Ori, for, for doing this exhibition and, and speaking to us all about it. My pleasure. I guess that makes me next, right? So my starting point in thinking about this exhibit, as it usually is when things pertinent to the Jewish visual arts come up is, what is art? And one of the ways in which one can always define it as a reflection of the artist's experience in the world. And therefore, one asks the question of Jewish art, is there a particular Jewish experience in the world? And the answer is, you have to look all over time and space and recognize that there is an endless diversity of Jewish experiences. Um, so that while that provides a framework for a definition, it actually leaves the door open to just about everything. When one thinks about Jews, you know, one asks, are we a religion? Are we a culture? Are we a race and ethnicity? Are we a nation? Are we a civilization? Because all of those terms have been applied, particularly in the last 200 years or so, by both Jews and non-Jews to what we are. And we further have to ask a question when we use the phrase Jewish art, are we talking about the art itself, its symbols, its subject, its style, its content, its intent, or are we talking about the identity of the artist as such, uh, born Jewish, converted to Judaism, convictions that I'm Jewish, convictions that my art is Jewish, convictions that my art is not, but maybe it has something within it that I myself don't even recognize that is. In any case, the question is sort of, simplified when we turn to the topic that Robert wanted to address with this exhibition, Jewish identity and authenticity. So we understand we're talking about the artist and how that artist's identity informs the artwork, as opposed to necessarily seeking out particular symbols, styles, subjects in the artwork itself. And the uh, request for submissions received an outpouring of extraordinarily, as he said, fine work from all over the world, really. And within that, as he said, about half from the DC, Virginia, Maryland uh, area and half from elsewhere. And among the 40 or so artists represented, 23 of them are associated with the Jewish Art Salon. So that which is the ultimate repository, ever expanding of Jewish artists and their ever evolving identities as such is very appropriately uh, a kind of backbone of this whole thing. And as I began to think about the art, I found that I could in loose terms, put it into about six different kinds of groupings, understanding that those groupings overlap often and are not absolutely absolute. 
So where would my starting point be? Guess what? Text, the people of the book. So was there art that has a textual basis? And in particular, what is the text that is the basis for Judaism at the beginning of the beginning? And that's, of course, the Bible. So it was very easy to start with a number of works. And I'm just going to refer to two because these are Jewish art, sal art salon members okay. who won't be presenting. And now uh, we're going to try and go with some images. So the first that, that uh, comes up is Yevgeny Pavlova's work, which you can see. Um, to the... So you can recognize Bereshit Bara Luhimet Hashemayim Veta Aretz, the text that's on there. And the, and the piece is called First There Was a Word. So it kind of puns on the idea of what you get in Genesis. God said, let there be, and there was everything. But it also puns, I think, on the relationship between Jewish and Christian thinking about God and therefore about humans and therefore about art, because humans create as God created. Because for Christians, in a sense, the update on this comes at the beginning of, of John in the Gospels. In the beginning was the word. So she's playing with that. On the other hand, next image, please. As long as we're doing images, this is great. Joel Silverstein's work, Moshe, or Moses, rather, meets Modok, has uh, our favorite cartoonized character in Silverstein, Echt Silverstein style, who is Moses, confronting this big-headed creature who comes out of science fiction, Modok, who has had a number of iterations in the comic book world, but it's fair to say he kind of represents evil, and Moses, you could say, represents good. So among other things, Bible meets science fiction and good meets evil. So this engages text without having any text at all that is overtly as part of it. Next image, please. And the second section beyond this is a kind of historical sweep, both in a chronological sense and the visual sense and the conceptual sense. So here you're looking at a work for example, by uh, Stacy Lehman. And uh, she has taken a rabbinic passage, which has to do with fish swimming upstream and birds. She's converted it and she's transformed it, translated it in an altogether abstract kind of an idea so that the text has not only become image, it's become an abstract image. And she's transformed the text with the precise title of the work and she's transformed it by making it into this kind of an image. Next image, please. If one continues with this sweep and looks, for example, at this work by Carrie uh, Kessler, it's part of a whole series of these maps that she has done. And if you look, you realize it's not a real map and yet it suggests a map and the places that are on it, countries and, and cities are instead turns of phrase and terms and words Maps are all about place, right? Makom in Hebrew. Hamakom is one of the words we use to refer to God, the place. And one of the realities of the Jewish diaspora, of course, is that we're everywhere and nowhere until we get in the middle of the 20th century to Eretz Yisrael. And one of the things that one of our more important theologians, Abraham Joshua Heschel, once commented about us Jews is that we're not about place, we're about time. We don't build cathedrals. We build how one celebrates precisely from sunset to the end of the next day for Shabbat and for this and that festival. We're about time. We're not about space. And yet we're about all kinds of spaces. So this is everything that is both real and imagined about that idea. Next slide, please. And within the rabbinic tradition across time, this is your Judith, <laughs> Judith Joseph's engagement of the golem is the engagement of a particular time and place. It's Prague, it's the 17th century, it's Judah Lo, the great rabbi and mystic who creates this creature of earth, emulating in a certain sense God, but then it raises the question, does the golem have a soul? And a whole series of other questions that pertain to Jewish mysticism and the relationship between God and ourselves and how we connect ourselves to God. Next image, please. I have 17 to run through in 15 minutes, so no one's going to be satisfied that I've covered anything sufficiently, but that's how it goes. This is a work by uh, Julia Ilyutovich, um, which is called Why Do We Stay Up Here? And so it puns very much on that Sholem Aleichem series of stories that we associate with 
what became a Broadway play, Fiddler on the Roof, right? Hovering on the roof. It's all about Jewish diaspora, ex diaspora existence, nowhere more profoundly so than the Jewish presence throughout Eastern Europe and throughout the Tsarist regime and ultimately even into the Soviet period in, former, in the former Soviet Union, previous to that Russia. And she's playing on that kind of an idea as this fiddler fiddles very precariously on a roof of sorts. Next image, please. So we are already moving away from just the coverage of history into the way in which individuals embed their own lives and their families within the community into history. So Ju uh, uh, Joyce Ellen Weinstein, in one of her contributions to the exhibition, The Devil on My Shoulders, it is in a certain sense a self-portrait, right? But it's also playing with an idea that the Agadic tradition picks up from what we read in Genesis 6-5, and again in Genesis 8.21 about the notion of um, the evil inclination. And so we are always caught between choices of doing the right thing or the wrong thing, the wrong thing or the right thing. And that goes back to Adam and Eve and forward to the separation between Noah in Genesis 6 and the rest of reality. What does it mean to be evil, to have an evil inclination? And forward to the present time, every time we make a moral choice, we are making that um, as a reflection of who we are in whatever ways we define ourselves. Next image, please. So within this notion of um, Jewish, uh, Jewish personal family and communal relations to time and space, this work by um, Susan Schrott is called Nine Faces of Women. So at first glance, you're just seeing this spectacularly colorful, beautiful, very geometricized kind of, it's a series of windows, isn't it? And then you realize there's a face at each of those windows. And the idea of a face, particularly a female face at a window goes all the way back to Phoenician art. And we find it in ivories from Samaria in the ancient Israelite kingdom after Judah and Israel were separated from each other in the eighth pre-Christian century. But these particular women are all members of her family. So it's personal, it's family, it's communal, it's universal. They're different members of the family, nine of them, who are alive and who are dead. It also, needless to say, interweaves, pun intended because of the medium, the whole idea of women and their place within the history of art, which until really all too recently, was a place that was suppressed or ignored, and women in traditional Judaism, whose place has only recently emerged to places it never could have been imagined at a hundred or a thousand years ago. So all of these issues that are universal, that are Jewish, that are communal, that are familiar, that are personal, are interwoven together here. Next image, please. And we move up to another kind of category, but all of these, as you can tell, are overlapping. This category I call cultural realities and values. And the image I'm showing you here is by Hedy Abramowitz. It's called About the Conversation. And as much as it is a collage, it is conceptually a collage. It has elements that reflect on herself and her sense of self in the world as American, as Jewish, as European, as Israeli. In other words, not only herself, but the self that is the family of which she is part of an ongoing line. Next image, please. And within the culture of contemporary Judaism and particularly that in Israel, one of the more outstanding and important poets of modern Israel is of course Yehuda Amichai, who uh, died about what, 20 years ago or so. And Rick Black did this spectacular work. It's a handmade book called Amikai Windows. So you can see all of them open and close its triptych form, like that kind of a window. And each of them gives us an image or more than one image, together with text, both in Hebrew and in English, of 18 different Amikai poems. Now, most of you probably realize that in the numerology of Hebrew, the letters Chet and Yud that make up the word life also make up the word, um, the number 18, so that the 18 windows are life, 
but it's also part of the poet's name, Amichai. My people lives is what his name actually means. Next page, please. And of course, when we think of Israel, this would be known as Zilberberg's work, then we think preeminently of the Kotel and her wonderful painting of the night at, at, night at the Kotel gives us what is essentially a kind of semi-abstract, suffused with color, with blues, with oranges, with greens, above all with red, it gives you a kind of visceral visual response to the magic that one can experience if one is at the Kotel, for example, in particular, Erev Shavuot, right? Which is the moment when the skies open up and you have a contact between us and God and the point of contact is the Kotel. Next image, please. And on the other hand, Leah Rab. On the other hand, the um, Jerusalem is notorious for being a contradiction in terms of paradox between Jerusalem above and below, the heavenward, the earthbound, the prophetic and the simply crazy. So here we've got one of her photographs. It's uh, a Jewish pirate, isn't it? So on the one hand, we see the sacred very clearly represented by the fact that this is an orthodox enough Jewish male that he's wearing a talit katan and we can see the tzitzit hanging below. On the other hand, he's got this, it's a pirate hat. So we figure, is he just a little bit off or is it Purim? In which case we're all supposed to be a little bit off and where to be better off a little bit than in Jerusalem at Purim. Next slide, please. Or Goldie Gross, one of whose two combination, uh, contributions rather right there, not my God, nicht mein Gott, but you can see that she's written God using the Paleo Hebrew script. Um, that takes us back to the Israelite era when we were being told there are no gods before me. So any of those Babylonian or Canaanite or Egyptian gods, not my God. But at the same time, this which looks kind of like a flattened Torah mantle with fringes at the bottom, which she specifically calls Israelite fringes, she does for a reason. Not my God. This is a play and a pun on the whole question of true Israel, veros Israel, in the whole history of Jewish-Christian relations, Christian supersessionist sense that we are the true Israel, the Jews are not, and the new twist that that has taken with the community in America called the Black Hebrew Israelites. And this was painted specifically in response to shootings that took place in December of 2019 in Jersey City. The Israelite fringes are their version of the tzitzit, and they have appropriated, therefore, the Jewish God for their own purposes, because as far as they're concerned, Jews who are not Black Israelite, Black Hebrew Israelite Jews are not real Jews. So the identity has been removed from us, from them. Next image, please. Our identity is emphatically present with Cassandra Clark's Juraf, Juraf, which as you can see is this wonderfully female uh, giraffe with a pair of breasts, which you can recognize as pomegranate seeds, all about fertility. She's got her dots, the spots rather, which are six pointed stars. She's got Lachaim on one arm. You can't see it from this angle, but on the other arm, it's that Herzlian word phrase rather, if you will, it will be no dream. It's all about asserting a unique identity as a creature that is like Jews were so for so long in so many places perceived to be other than human, and yet she stands up, she towers over everybody else. Next image, please. By contrast, Miriam Stern's work that it comes out of her experience, it's right over here, um, in Essaouira in, in Morocco, which has a long history with respect to Jews, Jewish mysticism, Jews involved in dying there. I don't mean as in dead, I mean as coloring things in its relationship with the United States at its inception. And she visited this um, wonderful old Jewish cemetery. And what you actually have here are images of very anthropomorphic kinds of gravestones made from marine stone. One of them still, you can see the inscription on it, sort of wearing away in this very ghostly reference to a past that is still present and yet not present as it was in the past with questions for its future. And lastly, we come around in the next section, next image, please, to ceremonial objects, which brings us in a sense full circle to where we began, biblical text, the development of, 
of Jewish texts, the development of Jewish cer ceremonies that begin with the Bible or celebrations. And um, of course, Jewish ceremonial objects, particularly those made of metals, were in Christendom mo made mostly by Christian artists until the late 19th century. So the question of Jewish art with respect to the artist's identity in that regard has done an, an absolutely significant turn in the 150 or so years since that time. And it takes another twist in Ruth Simon McRae's Trees Talit, because it's a craft object to be used, right? It's a talit, complete with the appropriate tzitzit and all of that. And yet it's also a spectacular book, uh, sorry, work of art. It's not just craft, it's art. It's not just art, it's craft. And the whole idea of the images of trees, of course, puns on the idea that the Torah is a tree of life to them that hold fast to it. So we've come back full circle to the center of Jewish identity in the religious textual sense. And you literally wrap a talit around your shoulders as you pray, and certainly as you read from the Torah. And you use those tzitzit when you begin and finish your reading to mark the point of entry and exit into and from that text. One more image, please. Which brings us to Susie Lubell's image, which is Tu Bishvat, um, which is this absolute riot of color. And if you look carefully, you, you know, you see baskets of fruits, you see flowers, you see a bird in a cage, you see all the tastes and smells of that wonderful holiday late on the calendar in coming compared to Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, and the like, but which marks the beginning of the transition from winter to spring. And its celebration on the 15th, not the first of Shvat, represents a whole discussion between the School of Hill and the School of Shammai as to who should be able to bring their gifts of the first fruits to the temple. And of course, we are now in the midst of the transition from winter to spring, so it's an appropriate last image. The exhibition does have an epilogic uh, section, but no Jewish artists, no Jewish art salon artists in it. So you'll have to see them when you see them. And meanwhile, I turn the floor over to five Jewish art salon artists who can talk about their own work. And thank you all so very, very much. Ari, right, that was incredible. <laughs> you covered so much territory uh, with both breadth and depth. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, the next part of our program is five artists who are gonna just present briefly and talk about um, their piece in the exhibit. So I'm gonna start uh, with the work of Bilha. Hineni Eineni, seeing and being saved. The biblical Hebrew word Hineni means, here I am, I am ready, willing and able, unconditional. But there's another meaning of Hineni, even deeper and more resonant, here I stand. Eineni means I am absent, not available, transparent, I, am not, I do not exist. The image you see here on the screen is from my Bible notebook from the chapter Why Bilha and Zilpa are not counted Jew, um, Jewish matriarch. Rachel and Leah are included in the Jewish woman pantheon Bilha and Zilpa, their handmaid, mother of Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, four of the 12 tribes of Israel are filtered, sieved out. The erasure of Bilha and Zilpa from our traditional consciousness is an emblem of the exclusion of marginalized women in society. And uh, this history is inhabited with or by nobody who never chose to be anybody. To translate this history or these issues into images, images I choose for objects from the kitchen household. One of them is the sieve, which I use a lot of my, in my work. It is charged with female intimacy, the fundamental symbol of separation and filtration a metaphor for individual transport of traumas and memory. Hineni, here I stand. The glass shoes 
is all about transparency. The high hill is about limited balance and limited territory. This in contrary to the upper part of the sculpture, which is all about balance and demanding or regaining your place and space. Um, Hineni, here I am, ready, willing and able, unconditional, hang on and let me turn this game off. Hineni, a neni, pair of words like a conjoined head on a coin. Um, one note before I finish. Uh, about the sieve, the role of the sieve in all Jewish fertility rituals. Among Bedouin tribes and a lot of Jewish community in um, North Africa, as well as among Jews in the Caucasus, it is customary to catch a baby in a sieve at birth. It's quite an, an image. The sieve is your first cradle, symbolizing the wisdom of power to distinguish between good and evil in the future life. Thank, Thank you, you. Bella. That was fascinating. We're going to continue with the presentations and you can ask questions at the end, but you're welcome to put them in the chat. So our next artist is Diana Kurtz. Diana, please unmute yourself and talk to us about your two pieces. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? You're good. I can okay. hear you. First of all, Orla, I think you were terrific what you said. Every time you speak, I learn something about myself as well as about history. And what's very interesting is, um, I don't know, it's interesting to me at least. I grew up as Orthodox Jew. I'm still very involved with Judaism, um, my religious life, my personal life. However, in 1988, if anybody ever told me I would paint something to do with Judaism, or to do something personal about me, I wouldn't have believed them. I started as an abstract painter. I painted the figure from the model large nudes in my studios for many, many years. In 1989, I happened to see um, a small photograph of some of my relatives who did not survive the Holocaust. And it suddenly came, it came to my attention or my thought that my mother and myself and a few elderly relatives are the only ones that knew these people existed. There was no record in Yad Vashem. There was no record anywhere about these people. So I thought I would take this small <laughs> photograph and just make a little drawing for myself and my family. And now it sounds so strange because people work so much from photographs. When I grew up as an artist, photographs were taboo as subject matter. So for me, it was kind of heretical and very strange to start working directly from photography, from photographs. It sounds weird now, but that's how it was in the 80s and 90s. Anyhow, I made this small watercolor drawing. That drawing became a larger drawing. It finally became a very large painting, about a six foot by five foot painting. I usually paint very large. That painting led me to another painting, to another painting. And suddenly I found myself doing these paintings based on my family's experience, based on relatives, who um, there's no, like I said, there's no record of these people ever having existed other than my painting. So I thought it was my job in the world somehow to make these paintings. And suddenly my work became completely personal in the sense that my history was kind of showing in what I was doing, um, if that makes any sense. The painting here is a very small painting. Um, it's a, one of my cousins, I had two cousins and the parents who were in Yugoslavia. The only thing we know about that family is that these small children, when the Nazis came into Belgrade, these small children were sent into a Catholic hospital, thinking at least they would be saved. Somebody came in and denounced these children along with other Jewish children. They were never heard from again. And I felt it necessary to write on these small paintings that I do in this particular one, a little bit of the history Again, this was at the time, now in 2021, it's hard to think that people did not write words in their paintings, at least contemporary artists or work from photographs, but I did feel I wanted to put this little baby in context. And also for me, and as I realized as we're showing my work and talking about it, especially in a lot of universities and colleges, 
when you say one and a half million children were killed in the Holocaust, it's sort of it's hard to fathom. It doesn't make sense. You see one child and it begins to hit home. The way that one um, very famous photograph of the dead child that was trying to do the crossing um, on the beach, that dead child meant so much more than when you see hundreds and thousands of children. So that's the reason I painted this. Well, actually I painted this painting as a kind of memorial, but it also stands for the one and a half million other children who disappeared during the war. Um, could I have the next slide, please? There are two pictures and I'm trying to stay within my time limit. Um, these people were not my immediate family, but they could very well have been. They symbolize other relatives of mine who also were never heard from again. These were two brothers um, and I pictured them again from a photograph that a friend had shown me. And for me, it symbolized the two kinds of Jews. There was this funny feeling in this country, and I think it may still exist, that all the Jews from Eastern Europe were from Fiddler on the Roof. People, and again, I've learned so much as I've been showing my work in non-Jewish context of people's misconceptions of what Jews were like. Jews were also very sophisticated, very worldly, and very elegant. So I thought this photograph of these two brothers shows these two different kinds of Jews, um, symbolizes the people that were there. On the top, um, there's a little writing. The last that was heard of in this country from these two men was a postcard that came from an unknown destination that said, God will help us. And on the bottom, there's a kind of fidella of a photograph that I did when I went to Auschwitz of the bars in Auschwitz, um, the repetition. Thanks to Andy Warhol, I, I got that idea of repetition with slight variation. And this painting is very large. Um, figures are over life size. We still don't know if it can be in the actual exhibition because of the large size and the difficulty of transportation, but it will be, I hopefully, in the catalog. And I think that's four minutes. Thank you so much, Diana. That was superb, as always. Thank you. Uh, our next artist is Rachel Cantor. Hi, thank you so much. Um, before I talk about my piece, I just want to give a little shout out to the Jewish Art Salon, to Day 8, and to Addis Israel Synagogue for supporting Jewish art. Um, it's really important, and I do appreciate it. Um, this piece is called Tali Katan, and um, all my art that I do is informed by Jewish texts, Jewish study that I do regularly, and uh, Jewish rituals. And it's interesting um, talking about an artist's identity. Um, for myself, it's really hard to um, separate my identity as an artist and the artwork um, that, I, that I make and my identity as a Jew and the artwork that I make. Um, so this is based on a, the idea of a talikatan in traditional Judaism, it would be a white undershirt that um, Orthodox or traditional men would wear that would have tzitzit, one on each corner, have the four fringes on. And I wanted to create a talikatan for women. Um, a lot of my work talks about women's rituals and feminist ideas within Judaism. And so when I was thinking about an undergarment for a woman, I thought of a whole slip, a full slip. So I took a pattern from the 1940s, a sewing pattern of a whole slip. And to me, it was very important that it was black and dark. So I hand dyed the silk and I created these talikatan. I put the four fringes, the tzitzit on the bottom corners. And I also um, embroidered and sewed some glass beads on them that correspond to astrological signs. So not only is this piece about Tali Katam, but it's really about Rosh Chodesh, which um, historically and traditionally, Rosh Chodesh is the new month in Judaism. And there is a prayer, an extra prayer that you say, celebrating and acknowledging the new month. And historically, Rosh Chodesh was set aside for women if they wanted to study or not work that day. But it wasn't a big celebration. It comes once a month. Um, and about maybe 30, 40 years ago, Jewish feminists started 
to reinterpret Rosh Chodesh and kind of reinvigorate Rosh Chodesh as a true woman's holiday. And it came with all these new rituals that they created around it. So it wasn't just the prayer being said at synagogue, but it was all these new rituals. So in my mind, this piece tells that story. So these slips are hanging on, a, on an antique drying rack. They've been cleaned. They're ready to be worn. Women are coming together. They're putting on their talit katan and going out into the night when the holiday will start at sundown, going out into the night, which is going to be a dark sky because Rosh Chodesh has no moon and are going to celebrate this holiday. So that's why there are the stars on these. That's why they are black. Um, and just one thing, talking about authenticity and identity, um, my work really questions what is authentic, what is authentic Judaism, and especially this piece does, talking about a woman wearing a talikatan, and is that an authentic Jew? And are these authentic ritual objects or ritual garments? Um, and so while my work is rooted in Jewish learning and practice and talks about Jewish rituals, it also talks about these greater universal ideas of a woman's place in society, of ideas about pushing back about patriarchy, and about women coming together and creating new celebrations for themselves. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, our next artist is Hillel. Uh, Hillel Smith, sorry. Hi, um, really a pleasure to be here and a uh, pleasure to be included uh, in this show. Um, so much of the work that I've been doing over the course of, I would say about the last 10 years has been focused on this interplay that uh, Robert spoke about at the very beginning of incorporating what is what we would think of as quote unquote traditional Judaism, traditional iconography uh, with a very contemporary aesthetic. Um, I, I know that I'm one of the youngest members in the Jewish art salon, um, and I have a very different aesthetic that's informed by comic books, by contemporary uh, graphic design, by uh, street art. And for me, how I incorporate those two very different uh, parts of my identity uh, is something that I try to bring out in the work that I create of how do I take this ancient Jewish tradition and this contemporary aesthetic, these contemporary media, uh, and create something that is both relevant um, and reverent of the past, um, but also something that feels very contemporary and very of the moment. Um, this is uh, one of the very first pieces that I had created in this kind of uh, you know, body of contemporary Jewish work. Um, this is Theodore Herzl, his famous quote, Im Tirzu Enzo Agada, if you will, it is no dream, uh, though originally spoken in German, um, very much inspired by, at the time, Shepard Fairey's Obama poster, um, the ideas of uh, contemporary hero worship of this vision for a bright and new future. Um, and so thinking about what Obama represented to a lot of America in 2007, 2008, um, and then thinking about, well, what did Herzl represent to the Jewish people at the time in the late 19th century of this idea of a better, brighter future through togetherness. Uh, and here using uh, this piece is done with spray paint. Um, and so using what I would think of as a very contemporary medium, a uh, contemporary aesthetic design sensibility um, to uh, create a, I what I would hope to be a new conversation around uh, this kind of uh, modern Jewish iconography. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then in a similar vein, um, a large part of my practice over the last number of years has been doing large scale uh, street art style mural painting. Um, this is a roughly 20 foot by 20 foot mural on the back of a bakery in Los Angeles. It's a kosher bakery and the piece reads Hamotzi Lacha Min Haaretz, which is the prayer for bread, which seemed like a very appropriate thing to put on the back of a bakery. Um, and here again, using a very, uh, you know, this very traditional text that, you know, the source text that goes back thousands of years, but marrying it with this very, very of the moment contemporary design aesthetic and a, uh, an artistic medium. Um, and in this case, thinking about uh, placemaking, so what does it mean to have large scale Jew explicitly Jewish public art in a uh, cosmopolitan city? Um, what does it mean to also to meld these two, this tradition and this uh, contemporary look? 
Um, and what does that speak? And what can that speak to uh, our place as Jews in a very contemporary society? Um, and how we each as individuals uh, deal with that interplay of uh, our own connection to our history and our tradition, but also our place in the modern world, our modern sensibilities, and for those of us who are here as artists, um, our modern influences in the work that we put together. Um, and so to speak about authenticity, it's about, well, what is authenticity in a Jewish context? Is authenticity looking exclusively to the people and the uh, you know, uh, body of knowledge that came before us, or is it being authentically Jewish to be very invested in um, to be in, uh, cognizant of the work around us. Um, and as I'm uh, posting to the chat, um, I am very much inspired by uh, Jewish artists, particularly of the late 19th and early 20th century, who looked around at the uh, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Dada, uh, Constructivism, and, uh, and all of these other very contemporary styles, and then used them to make Jewish work that was very, very authentic to them, um, but also very meaningful based on how it connected them to the world around them. Well, thank you very much. Fantastic, awesome work, Hillel, very fresh. Thank you very much. Our next artist is Heather Stoltz. And everyone else, please uh, silence your mic, if you would. We're getting some background noise. Thank you. First, I wanted to say thank you to Ori, Robert, Judith, Yona, the Jewish Art Salon, and everyone else who made the, this exhibition possible. It's really been wonderful to hear all about the magnificent work in this exhibition, and I'm really honored to be a part of it. Um, so before having children, I felt most connected to Judaism and the Jewish community when in the synagogue participating in communal prayer. When my daughter was born, I would wrap her in the baby sling and bring her to Shabbat morning services. It was truly wonderful to have my baby girl sleeping on my chest while the songs and prayers washed over us. Of course, she wouldn't sleep through the whole service. When she woke up, I would find a dark corner in the synagogue to feed her, and then it was hard to keep her quiet if we returned to the service. So we would wander the halls or visit the kids' services. Before long, we had a second child, and it was just too hard to keep two kids quiet. Since I wasn't able to focus on the prayers anyway, there was no incentive to try. So why make the effort to get everyone out of the house in time if we would just end up sitting in the hallway outside the sanctuary? So we ended up just coming for the kids service and stopped attending the main services. One Shabbat morning, we ended up in the service for older children. The person leading it paused before the Shema to talk about the custom of gathering the tzitzit from the four corners of the Artali Tot. My breath caught in my throat as I realized I had completely forgotten about this tradition that I had once performed every day. Other practices started slipping away too. Without the prayer and feeling of community that I had once loved, Judaism had started losing meaning for me. Since I had no solution for how to fix the problem, I turned to artwork to, to express the feelings of the loss that I was experiencing. This piece hanging by a thread, um, shows how my connection to Judaism was eroding. The piece takes the shape of a talit with words from the blessing before putting on a talit hand-painted on the atara, or what would be the atara. The embroidered lines start out like stripes on a traditional talit, but are broken and fraying as they get farther from the top. The talit itself is also coming undone with large tears, and the knots on the tzitzit are also untying. A tiny figure at the bottom clutches onto the tzitzit, trying to hold on to what's left of her Judaism. Um, so this is kind of my, my um, experience of losing identity and trying to kind of clutch onto some authentic self within Judaism. Thank you very much, Heather. It's a really um, compelling piece and I appreciate your comments about it. Um, we have a few minutes for uh, questions for the artists. So um, Dorit, I didn't get a chance to look at the chat, so. There is a question for, by uh, Regina. You can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, um, thank you very much for this. Usually in Manhattan, I'm at art gallery openings all the time. And I find that 
when something when I see something in an art piece and I talk to the artist about it, there are times when that artist does not see what I've seen. There are times when they see it for the first time when I talk about their art. And uh, the first uh, person who, who uh, spoke, the curator, I have a question, the comments and critiques that you made, uh, are they from the artist or from you only or a combination of both? A combination of both. Each uh, artist submitted his or her work together with one sort of with some sort of a comment about <clears throat> how it relates to the overall subject of identity and authenticity. Heather, for example, uh, spoke exactly about what she just spoke about in her in what she wrote. Um, some did more, some did less. So that's part of it. And then, yes, it's my own interpretation, my own connecting things. I mean, one of the things that I connected Hillel Smith's work to was that wonderful child's book uh, about, what's it called? Sunshine Bread? I'm, I'm getting it wrong now, but some of you are probably familiar with it. Um, it's, what, it's, it's something, Hillel, that it just made me think of. So I, I mentioned that in, in my critique. I missed... I would say 30% at least of what Rachel shared about her piece. And, and in fairness to myself, I couldn't see the details and maybe I would have recognized, you know, the, the Zodiac and so on, and then thought of the whole, you know, I got the general tenor of it, but there are details that are wonderful that you just share that I didn't. So my long-winded answer, um, Regina, is a, a combination. And I have, by the way, had the experience that you just described any number of times, um, with artists who said, oh, you know, I, oh, I didn't realize, you know, you're right. I just didn't realize I was doing that, yeah. which is fine, you know, because obviously part of what we do is unconscious. And if it's too self-conscious, it's often not that good because it's too self-conscious. So, but as I always say to my students, I can't prove anything about this. I can't prove it. But we, going back to our tradition of text, Thou shalt not commit murder. All right, there's the commandment. Now someone tell me what it means. I can't kill a mosquito. I can't defend myself against someone attacking me with a knife. What does it mean to commit murder? And by the way, if I translate it into English the way the King James Version does, and it says thou shalt not kill because it gets the Hebrew wrong, then I'm really in trouble because the interpretation of the revelation is what we spend all of history doing regardless of our religion and our revelation. So art, text, music, it's all about a combination of the revelation and the creation on the one hand and the interpretation on the other. And I don't know that there is, I mean, something can be completely ridiculously wrong and something can be spot on and there can be things that are kind of fall in between. Amen, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. I see a lot of praise in the chat. I don't necessarily see questions, so. Um, we'll take that. <laughs> yeah, we'll take the praise. <laughs> But, I, just um, wonder, I just wonder, Ori, if you, that was fascinating, if you have uh, going to make some catalog with your curatorial. Oh, yes, yes, yes. No, uh, Robert has produced, and with, with Day 8 and with the support of Addis and the other organization that were part of this, a spectacular catalog, actually, uh, much fuller fledged than I would have imagined possible. And I believe not only will the catalog be in, in, uh, available in the flesh, so to say, or in the paper, uh, but it will also be available online. Um, so, yeah. All right, great. So once you have the link, you can send it to the Jewish Atalon. And we I believe so. Them. Robert, you would know the answer better than I to that, that logistic yes, part. One of, the, one of the things I'm, I'm sitting here realizing that I don't yet have the the sign up form live that I was intending to put in the chat for people to be able to sign up to be notified when the catalog is available. Um, but I, I will put a I will put a chat in to where you will be able to find the catalog once it once it is available and would suggest that people visit authenticityandidentity.com in like two or three days. And then there will be there will be a there will be a sign up there where you'll be able to to sign up to be notified when the catalog is available. You could sign up in the chat right now too, and we could collect those. 
I'm breathless. I don't know about you all, but that was that really covered a lot of ground. And um, I, I have a question for the artist, if I can, if I can jump in. I'm, I'm please. really curious. With day eight, one of the things that I do is produce an arts journalism fellowship project, and with, through that project, every year we do a conference. And this past year, the conference was focused on the issue of crossing borders. That an arts journalist is by necessity, taking a product that maybe was produced from within a culture that they that they are less familiar with. If I if I'm interpreting a, a, a piece of rap music, um, you know, what, whatever the borders that might be being crossed, that there's a lot of times when art journalists are interpreting things that are created uh, cross culturally. And what are the best practices there? Like, how do you, you know, if someone doesn't get the references, one of the things that's been just absolutely sh shocking and 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 rewarding for me in, in working on the catalog is the is are the scores of the deals that that Ori is able to make, the connections Ori is able to make that that I'm that I'm sure the majority of them are in fact in the artist's mind, but that I didn't have the framework for. And I'm I'm curious for the artists how you feel about review of your work and if you feel like your work is sort of missed in certain ways because of its content or because it connects to Judaism in various ways. I'm, I'm curious about the, I'm curious about that. Diana, why don't you unmute and tell us what you think. What's interesting to me, um, I saw so I've had, I think, 13 solo shows just of this Holocaust series. Unfortunately, none of them have been in a Jewish venue. No Jewish museums seem interested. I don't know. But I've shown them in a lot of universities and college galleries throughout the United States. And very often I start off giving an, what I think is an artist talk and that what people want to talk about usually is the Holocaust and the children and the people in my paintings. And what I found at the last show I had of this was at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, where the student population is basically Black and Hispanic. And I cannot tell you how moved I was when these children, and I shouldn't say children, they're young college people in their 18, 19, 20, came over to me and told me they didn't know this story before, but it reminds them of things in their own family and their own background. Sometimes they would cry, they'd make me cry. But I felt I was doing such a kind of educational important thing like for Judaism, for people that don't really know about the Holocaust and they know all these Jews were killed, but they don't realize that these were individual people. Like, like what's going on with COVID? Every once in a while, we need to be reminded that it's not just 500,000 people that died, but it's the families and their individuals. So on that kind, kind of crossing borders, I think art can maybe communicate in a certain way that maybe words cannot. Well, I think that's a, a great note for us to wrap up this program. We've run over our time a little bit. And Diana, I think that's a, a, a great message for all of us that art definitely can pull us together and communicate in ways that words can't. So keep doing it. <laughs> um, I wanna thank you all for participating in this program. Uh, Ori and Robert and all of the artists and all the, the people who came to attend and think about it and ask questions. Our next program will be Tuesday, March 23rd at noon Eastern time. The presenting artists are Joanna Dion Brown Richard Rutner and Julia Reimer Rucker. And I'd like to just remind you that we are inviting artists to submit work for our next series of Jewish Art Salon Open Studios programs, uh, which is called After the Flood Regenesis. And even if you've already presented, you will be considered for another presentation. And if you haven't presented, please let us see your work because um, it's a great way to share your work with a large audience at this time around the world. So thank you and stay healthy and keep well. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And Dorit, stay on for a minute. <laughs> stay for a minute. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, Ari. That, your thank you. your uh, summation was, was unbelievable. It really was great. <laughs>